Viewer discretion is advised. The professor then felt uneasy and quickly instructed his assistant to pull the personnel out of the water. But he continued saying, and now he swallowed it. Damn, that's gonna haunt my dreams. Wait, it stopped moving. I think it sees me. Oh God, it's looking right at me. Hello everybody, I'm the rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-1128. SCP-1128, also known as the Aquatic Horror, is an entity that manifests as a massive aquatic predator to anyone given a full description of the being's appearance, through either spoken and written descriptions or visual depictions of the being. Victims infected by 1128 will initially exhibit no abnormal behavior, though some cases show a general aversion to activities involving bodily immersion in water such as bathing or swimming. If victim ever be fully immersed in water, they will disappear completely under the surface of the water, regardless of the water's actual depth. In most cases, victims will reappear moments later in a panicked state and frantically try to leave the water, while in some other cases, the water will become polluted with blood and debris, confirmed to be the remains of the victim. Victims that have reappeared intact claim that they were transported to a vast ocean where they are pursued by 1128. Interviews with these individuals carry some risk of further 1128 contamination, as descriptions of the being's appearance trigger further infections. Depends how far along the infection is, at first it requires full submersion, but over time it'll take less and less water until you could step in a puddle and fall in. 1128 infection can be treated with Class C amnestics, as it appears memory of the entity or descriptions of it are required for its anomalous properties to take effect. Testing with infected D-Class have shown that wireless communication devices function normally when used by submerged victims affected by SCP-1128. In an experiment, a D-Class personnel was instructed to read from a small pamphlet describing 1128's appearance. Then he was outfitted with diving gears which has a wireless communication device to allow contact between himself and a professor from the foundation. He was then lowered into a large tub of water via winch and cable. As soon as he hits the bottom of the tub, he told the professor that it looks like he had landed in a patch of seaweed. He started moving around and suddenly he saw the scariest thing. The professor refrained him from describing it any further, but wants to know what that thing was doing. What is it doing? The professor asked. The personnel replied, Nothing right now, it's just swimming along. I think it's got something in its mouth. Is that a whale? Holy crap, it is. It's eating a whale. Oh God, look at those teeth. The professor then felt uneasy and quickly instructed his assistant to pull the personnel out of the water. But he continued saying, And now he swallowed it. Damn, that's gonna haunt my dreams. Wait, it stopped moving. I think it sees me. Oh God, it's looking right at me. It's headed this way. Oh God, help me. After a few seconds of hysterical and spouting gibberish, the feed cuts to static. The winch was retracting at full speed when the cable went taut, resting the winch from its mounting. Cable then went slack and water became polluted with blood, confirmed to be that of the personnel. No further remains or equipment were recovered. Interview log and relevant documents were edited for vectors and all staff present were treated with Class C amnestics. Tracking devices affixed to D-Class personnel used in SCP-1128 experiments reveal that submerged victims are transported to an ocean. After this discovery, one of the doctors asked, that's where we've been sending those D-Class? How does a short-range wireless communicator get such a clear signal from that far away? Mobile Containment Force MCF Kappa-12 Sea Devils has been assigned to keep unauthorized seafaring vessels out of this area at all costs. MCF Sea Devils has been assigned to intercept and redirect any and all water traffic that passes through their designated patrol area by any means necessary. In one of the testing involving D-Class personnel D-1732, who had been used for repeated 1128 testing without administration of amnestics, was shown to be able to encounter 1128 in bodies of water normally insufficient for bodily immersion. This effect became more drastic over time, 
with D1732 developing progressively stronger hydrophobic tendencies. Claiming to see 1128 from outside almost any body of water encountered by the subject. Days after initial exposure, D1732 was violently pulled into a glass of water. Unfortunately, no remains were recovered from the incident. Staff witnessing the event were found to be infected by 1128 and administered Class C amnestics. Containment procedures were then updated to include videos and descriptions of this event, and testing involving extended infection of D-Class was terminated. According to experiment log A2, a D-Class was equipped with scuba gear and exposed to 1128, placed into a standard protective shark cage and lowered into water. There was no response for a few seconds. Then the line went taut and was severed at a point beneath the water. Remains of the D-Class as well as jagged steel fragments, presumably remnants of the cage, surfaced shortly afterward. In the next experiment, experiment log A3, the same result occurred. A few hours later, MCF Sea Devils reported to have found an intact shark cage floating beneath the surface of patrol area near one of their vessels. Item was retrieved and confirmed to match description of cage used in experiment A3. Cage was undamaged, but found traces of human DNA and feces of indeterminate origin. No further remains of D-Class found. In another experiment, unlike previous tests, the exposed D-Class was equipped with diving gear, armed with a weapon for use against hostile organisms, and was also equipped with a live feed video camera attached to his helmet. Video feed shows that the weapon was ineffective against 1128, appearing only to enrage the creature rather than harm it considerably or drive it away. Feed was lost when D-Class was devoured. The staffs involved were treated with amnestics following transcription of video feed. In an experiment to test 1128 manifestation in liquids other than water, an exposed D-Class equipped with protective environment suit and video feed was lowered into a vat of substance. This substance was chosen for its low density, allowing free movement similar to walking in open air. Incredibly, the D-Class recovered without any incident. The liquid did not trigger 1128's effect. Although you might be safe from 1128 in liquids other than water, but that probably won't help you much unless you intend to drink and bathe in exotic chemicals for the rest of your life which probably would get a lot shorter if you tried that. Written descriptions and imagery of SCP-1128's appearance or videos of the entity found outside the foundation are to be destroyed, and Class C amnestics are to be administered to anyone exposed to such information or showing signs of 1128 contamination. A written description of the entity's appearance is to be kept at site for experimental purposes only and is not to be read by anyone other than D-Class used for testing. If exposed, staff are to report immediately for administration of Class C amnestics. Dr. Krishnamurthy says, Manava, I was wrong. God save me. It's not. SCP-3000 strikes and quickly consumes Krishnamurthy. 3000 disappears into the darkness and is no longer visible on exterior cameras. Hello everybody, I'm the Rubber. Today we bring you a SCP Foundation Thiumel class object, SCP-3000. SCP-3000, also known as a Anatasesha, is a massive aquatic serpentine entity strongly resembling a giant moray eel. Its size is impossible to determine but it is estimated to be roughly between 600 to 900 kilometers in length. Its head measures roughly 2.5 meters in diameter, and sections of the body proper are as large as 10 meters in diameter. 3000 is carnivorous, and typically a sedentary creature, only moving its head in response to certain stimuli or during feeding. Despite its sedentary nature, 3000 is capable of moving quickly to dispatch prey. However, it doesn't actually need nutrients to maintain its biological function, though its size is huge. It is unknown exactly what happened to the prey it consumes, but during feeding, 3000 excretes through its skin, a thin layer of a viscous, dark gray substance classified as Y909. The Y909 compound is a critical component in several modern and experimental amnestic compounds. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity. Direct observation of 3000 may cause several mental alterations. 
the observer will experience inexplicable head pain, paranoia, general fear and panic, and memory loss or alteration. According to a log from Site 151's historical records, written by Dr. Eugene Goetz, during the initial discovery of SCP-3000, an unease was felt throughout the entire crew. A biologist of the Foundation named William felt the most ill. He began sweating profusely and act more and more erratically, at one point expressing uncertainty as to the task he was assigned to handle. When the crew finally came into contact with 3000, William began whimpering and had to be sedated. He muttered the word no over and over again, as if in disbelief. He went silent after a while as the crew approached 3000's head. Something had gone from William's eyes. Moments after they observed the head of SCP-3000, several other crew members complained of feeling hazy and of being uncertain what they were supposed to be doing. Captain Ritter wrote it off as nitrogen intoxication and forced them to continue approaching 3000. When the crews were 50 meters away from 3000, it turned slowly to look at them. At that moment, William began screaming and flailing, shouting about how he could see it in his head. Other Foundation personnel tried to restrain him, but he got free and smashed his face against one of the portholes. He hit it so hard, he cracked the inner layer of glass. The damage was bad enough that the crew had to surface and try to give William medical attention. But he was too far gone at that point. Despite the trauma, he still spoke briefly as he lay dying. He said, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. By the time they had reached the surface several hours later, William was dead. In the log, Dr. Eugene Getz wrote that even now, he can still see the eyes of SCP-3000. Despite this incident, a diving expedition was ordered to personally assess the creature and investigate the source of the thick, gray fluid that had been observed floating around its head. The dive team was composed of three members of mobile task forces, Kingfishers. All divers were equipped with high-pressure suits as well as front-facing headlamps. The water was dark and cold. They were in position about 500 meters from the head of SCP-3000. Moments after being in the water, the team leader told the command station that they seemed to have some confusion over their call sign, and they were not sure where they were going. They felt an awful headache, like something's needling in their brain. Regardless, command told the team to continue towards 3000, but all the divers were completely confused about where they were. As they continued approaching, one of the divers began to utter ominous phrases concerning oblivion and dark eyes. Just at that moment, command detected 3000 moving rapidly towards the divers, and their radios went silent. After 33 seconds of silence, one of the divers finally answered to the radio. According to the log, the leader of the team said 3000 opened its mouth and suddenly there was the sound of a struggle through the other two radios. Only one of them remains, the other two have been eaten by 3000. The one remained not being eaten claimed that it's extremely difficult to form thoughts while near 3000. He said that the fluid was seeping through the skin around its head, about a meter back. Just looking at the stuff is making him feel like the room is spinning. He feels nauseous and his head isn't working right. He went to retrieve a sample and attached it to one of those little balloons and let it float up so command will be able to get it later. After that, he claimed that he knows he is dying and told the command station not to send anyone else out there. It is so dark. Command continued to attempt to communicate with O9 Bravo, but Bravo grew increasingly unintelligible before eventually going completely silent. Bravo's radio stayed active over the next three days and intermittent breathing could be heard until the radio ceased functioning. In the beginning, we have mentioned that SCP-3000 is a Thomiel class entity. Thomiel class SCPs are anomalies that the Foundation specifically uses to contain other SCPs. Even the mere existence of the Thomiel class objects is classified at the highest level of the Foundation, and their locations, functions, and current status are known to few Foundation personnel outside of the O5 Council. So, how can a giant moray eel that messes up your head helps the SCP Foundation in their operations? The answer is in the dark gray substance classified as Y909. SCP Foundation uses a large number of amnestic during their work. It is vital for keeping the secrecy of the Foundation. The inclusion of the Y909 compound has shown a marked increase in the stability and long-term effectiveness of the Foundation's amnestics. Overall, amnestics utilizing Y909 break down 78% slower than their standard counterparts in cold storage, and 52% slower than their standard counterparts at room temperature. 
Additionally, individuals administered an amnestic regimen utilizing Y909 show a marked increase in suggestibility, memory clearance, and a significant decrease in additional side effects. Individuals treated with these amnestics express significantly fewer intrusive memories as those without Y909, with some individuals exposed to experimental compounds expressing no intrusive memories whatsoever, even at the 5 and 10 year marks. Due to the effectiveness of these treatments with the addition of Y909, the continued inclusion of the compound is essential to modern foundation amnestic application. The SCP Foundation has completely relied on the Y909 compound with no means to synthetically reproduce it. Hence, the ATZAC protocol has been developed. This protocol dictates the way the Y909 compound is collected off of SCP-3000 and the way personnel are to interact with 3000. According to the brief framework of the procedure documented, one individual D-class subject is to be administered a sedative and equipped with a high-pressure diving suit. The subject is then to be tethered to a remotely operated underwater vehicle, ROV, within the aft airlock. The airlock is to be flooded and the subject is to be towed by the ROV towards the feeding site. Upon reaching the feeding site, the ROV is to disconnect its tether, leave the subject there and return to the Foundation submarine named SCPF Aramida. Throughout this stage, SCPF Aramida should monitor SCP-3000's position and adjust course if the entity begins to move away from the feeding site. Mission Command will provide additional instructions during this phase if necessary. During the feeding session, no personnel are permitted to leave the Aramida without authorization from the Mission Command. At a point after the total consumption of prey, SCP-3000 will begin to excrete Y909 near the foremost section of its body. Specialized teams of deep-sea divers are to exit the SCPF Aramida through the aft airlock and approach SCP-3000. Collection of Y909 must take place during SCP-3000's digestive period, which is currently believed to be roughly two and a half hours after consumption of prey. Teams must return to launch craft before the end of this period. During this period, the typical effects of SCP-3000 are less severe, though command should continue to monitor these teams for damage to their cognition. After the collection of Y909, personnel are to transfer the collected substance to secure containers before returning to the surface. The mission administrator on board the Aramida is to monitor the substance throughout transport. The following report concerns two doctors, the Foundation's Level 3 researcher, Dr. Krish Namorthy, and a staff clinical psychologist, Dr. Manaba. Dr. Manava was assigned to interview Dr. Krishnamurthy after he attempted to exit out the Aramida's aft airlock without diving equipment. Dr. Krishnamurthy begins discussing how he feels disconnected from his mind and tired from trying to keep it together. He's forgetting things, having other people's dreams, and faces he doesn't recognize, places he has never been. Clearly, his proximity to 3000 is greatly affecting him. At this point, Dr. Krishnamurthy couldn't remember his mother's voice but he recalls that she told him about a god called Anantasesha, the king of serpents that lies beneath the god Vishnu in the cosmos. When the light of the universe had gone out, all that would be left is Anantasesha. Dr. Krishnamurthy believes that SCP-3000 is Anantasesha. He says in the interview with Dr. Manaba, I, I believe that SCP-3000 is Anantasesha. I believe that this, this aberration, this treachery against cognition is the result of us being in the presence of a god. Not just a god, but a god who exists across all time, all at once, and even beyond. Maybe, maybe some part of the nothingness beyond the edge of time is part of Anastasia as well. After two days of containment, orders were received to lift the hold order on Dr. Krishnamurthy in accordance to the terms of the ATSAC protocol. Three hours after Dr. Krishnamurthy was released from his holding cell, the following incident took place. Dr. Krishnamurthy stands near the entrance to the Aramida's aft airlock while weeping and prepares to open the airlock door. Interior airlock camera captures Dr. Krishnamurthy staring at the exterior airlock door for a full two minutes, not moving an inch. After two minutes, he collapses on the ground. As 3000 slowly approaches the submarine, Dr. Krishnamurthy puts on a high-pressure deep-sea diving suit and then moves towards exterior door controls and then exits the Aramida's aft airlock. SCP-3000 slowly appears out of the darkness, reaches Dr. Krishnamurthy, and his mouth begins to open. Aramida sounds horns, but neither SCP-3000 nor subject appear to notice. 
3,000 moves to just above Dr. Krishnamurthy. He appears to look up into the now fully expanded jaw of 3,000. Dr. Krishnamurthy says, Manava, I was wrong. God save me. It's not. SCP-3000 strikes and quickly consumes Krishnamurthy. 3000 disappears into the darkness and is no longer visible on exterior cameras. Rescue crews are recalled. The crew begins to initiate ATSAC protocol. The men took a fishing trip to the coast of South America. And while they're at it, they decided to sail around the coastline a little more. The trip itself was pleasant. The weather was glorious and the sea was behaving herself for the first few weeks. He had to admit he was loving it. But it didn't last long. Something baffling happened and shook the men to the core. They wanted to check out an archipelago that supposedly was in the travel guide's words breathtaking to the few dozen to have seen them. And true to those words, the views were spectacular. They were covered by emerald verdant grass, colorful flowers, and rocks that all seemed to be uniformly pointed towards the sky. Despite the oddity with the rocks and stones, he felt as though he was witnessing beautiful Mother Nature herself for all of five minutes. One by one, the island started shifting, slowly at first, creating colossal waves that shook the boat like a leaf in rapids. They then shifted faster, moving in a serpentine fashion as an enormous black shadow of some sort of archaic behemoth clouded the water below for miles around them. It continued for some odd minutes as the water soon became like miniature tidal waves that they barely made it over somehow, until all movement suddenly ceased and the shadow faded into the depths. The men looked at each other, soaked by the salty waters, and quickly made preparations to head to the mainland. Over there, look! A giant wave rose and was about to collapse on them. Brace yourselves! The wave crashed upon the ship, breaking it in half. As the men were tossed about in the water like a rag doll, they caught a glimpse of the creature, a behemoth that seemed to be the ocean itself. The men were but tiny specks of ants floating in the dark abyss. So this thing is responsible for their predicament, he thought. No, it was not responsible for anything that was happening. The Leviathan was merely existing, indifferent to the tidal waves on the surface, the sunken ship, or the drowning men. The survivors never spoke of what happened that day. The very thought of something that large prowling around the globe beneath the waves made the men question their own existence. So they decided to settle on ignorance, and ignorance is bliss. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you a SCP Foundation Keter class object, SCP-169. SCP-169, also known as the Leviathan, is believed to be an anthropod of gigantic proportions and the true beast behind the myth of the Leviathan. Much like many SCPs the Foundation has come across since its inception, the origins and true nature of such entities and objects are only theorized. 169 is no different. 169 was discovered by MTF Gamma-6 as the Foundation suspected anomalous activity stemming from the southern tip of South America in an archipelago. What aroused curiosity in Dr. Shirazawa and the Foundation itself was that the archipelago in question drifted several miles from their original locations in a rather serpentine fashion. After Gamma-6 was sent to investigate the islands, they were tasked with collecting soil samples, rock samples, vegetation, and any entities that they came across. If said entities were hostile, lethal force was authorized. A terrifying realization dawned on Gamma-6 as soon as they dug their shovels into the soil, and it promptly began to bleed, much like the growths they took off of their rock-like plates that were scattered across the island. Feeling that further exploration was unnecessary, Dr. Shirazawa ordered Gamma-6 to return to a site near the coast of Brazil. The soil samples and growths found on the rocks were determined to be organic material and flesh leading the doctor to understand that the archipelago was actually the spine of some gargantuan anthropod, hence why Leviathan is quite the appropriate moniker for it. According to Dr. Shirazawa and his researchers, 169 is estimated to be between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers in length and millions of years old. Seeing that such other anomalies of a similar nature were not found on the planet, it was then decided that 169 was possibly the last of its kind. 
therefore almost nothing is known about the creature other than it is possibly dormant. This is believed to be the cause because it only sways or moves a little less than a mile every week and breathes periodically every few months. The ramifications of 169 being active would certainly be seismic tremors and tidal waves. So monitoring of 169 is to happen 24-7 in case of any changes in activity. By direct order of the O5 Council, all ships that come into contact with or near 169 are to be scrapped and erased from all records public and private. All individuals on board such ships are to be given Class A amnestics and told that they were involved in a shipwreck but managed to survive. Thankfully, these two events are rare as the archipelago is home to several species of endangered animals and plant life and so the area and islands are off limits, quite conveniently. Any images taken from satellites of 169 are to be changed and or destroyed unless they have been taken with permission or by the Foundation. NASA has generously offered for the Foundation to use their own satellites to monitor and take photos of 169 after the Foundation donated a large sum of them. The U.S. National Oceanic Administration came close to discovering the existence of 169 after they detected an ultra-low frequency sound coming from around the southern coast of South America. An SCP agent within the administration tried to prevent this news from being released to the public, but failed in this task and the public at large learned of this. The Foundation, however, deduced from the news that the origin of the sound was in fact the head of 169. In the end, none was the wiser as to what made the sound. The O5 Council ordered that all attempts to uncover the truth of the noise were to be suppressed or sabotaged and undermined by embedded Foundation agents. Should 169 ever become active, it would mean the major seismic shifts in tidal waves, a natural disaster that rivals the vision of apocalypse. Several proposals have been made in regards to this possible event and many have to do with the utilization of reality-warping Thamiel-class SCPs, as suggested by Dr. Shirazawa. Dr. Shirazawa had a vision. A past researcher appeared in front of him in a dream. An old researcher friend of his. Back then, she was known as Mary Nakayama. She was a lively woman, a bright spot in the bleak foundation. No matter what gore or horrific knowledge she witnessed or obtained, she always smiled and hoped for a brighter future compared to Shirazawa's dismal outlook on the state of affairs. But that was the old Mary. Now she was known by her designation, SCP-001, the Godhead Eternal. After acquiring multi-universal levels of power and reality-warping capabilities, she had ascended to a high plane of existence, but promised that she would try to steer things right. It will take time, and to wish her luck before she left. He believed that she had returned to them through that dream of his, which of course brought terrible possible consequences as well. For why else would an omnipotent being such as herself make her presence known again in this world? That, and she said so herself. Shirazawa, my friend, she said, I have observed the world and the unfathomable universe that encapsulates our own and even the ones around that, and has determined that the Leviathan's stirring is simply the beginning of apocalyptic events set to come upon them soon. Visions flashed in Shirazawa's eyes. He was frightened by the hellscapes. If the Leviathan awakens fully, it will mark the beginning of a K-class extinction event. And should that happen, summon me, she said. She warned that she could only be summoned once and once only. Therefore, they must be extremely vigilant in preventing all disaster scenarios before they even think to have her aid. A Hail Mary, if they will. The O5 scoffed at him after hearing it. Do you have proof that she will indeed protect humanity and this planet from destruction? Surely you don't expect us to take a man's dream as fact, yes? Finally, it's about time a Thamiel class decides to help us out of its own free will. If she can prevent any K-class extinction event, then perhaps we should think about becoming more proactive with a few of our pressing problems facing the Foundation," he said sarcastically. But deep down, they all knew there was merit in Dr. Shirazawa's words. They have no such luxury. The doctor pulled out a small gray metal box with a small concave circle on the top of it that has a small hole in the center. She instructed any O5 council member to trickle their blood into this until the box is full. 
Only then will she be called here to protect us. I now give this to you. The doctor hands it over to the council and left the room. The council stared at the box, not sure what to make of it. They knew that the Leviathan could not be contained. One small move from it will rock the very foundation of the continents. They can only be saved once. If their demise doesn't come from the Leviathan, it would be from other threats. Apocalypse is inevitable in the end. Somewhere deep in the ocean where no light reaches, the Leviathan stirs. We hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Have a favorite SCP you want to see on this channel? Leave us your suggestions in the comments down below. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more SCP content, then check out some of our other videos right here. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye-bye.